<laughs> what did Elisha look like? And I handed the note card to the little, little boy in the class, and he looked at that card and he and he said he was bald, 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 bald. <laughs> <laughs> I love he it. Said that's hilarious. <laughs> and that was just about the time. And we went about. We talked about different things about him. You know, I said, "Was he from? Was he from a poor, destitute family?" And and then their card said, "No, he was from a wealthy family." Yeah. And uh, but anyway, I, I just thought yeah. I, I got to put that you on know, the card because it yeah. says it right there. But you anyway. never see a uh, receding hairline in the on the Bible picture character. So. <laughs> You never see them on Hollywood actors either. Right, right, right. Well, you know, Jim, I took Latin in high school, you know, and did very well in it. But and the thing I got out of it was breaking words down to know what they mean. Mm -hmm. Right. But they asked me to speak anything in it mm -hmm. now. Right. Well, I mean, it's basically a non-spoken language. Yeah, yeah. I took it. I took it in the ninth grade, Latin one, and then I went. From, uh, junior high school to high school, and I was going to take Latin too. And this little old lady walked in there, and I just did not like her. I took an mm -hmm. absolute <coughs> instant dislike to her. So I went and transferred to take French one. Mm -hmm. Who walks in to teach French? The one? same one. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you learn to like her? No. My, my, it only went downhill from the dislike to start with. My oldest son speaks fluent Spanish. Uh, and Hebrew. Porter, when you know, he, he spent last summer working down here at the uh, ferry, whenever they had somebody deaf who came to, for, to, for the ferry, they would have to call Porter to come over because Porter signs. Oh, yeah. How did he pick up signing? Uh, he took, yeah, he took it as his foreign language in high school. Oh, uh, and uh, and so uh, you know, Amy speaks a little bit of Spanish and does a little bit of signing, and you know I I I, I speak Southern, but without <laughs> yeah. It's important to know around who's who signs, because um, yeah, when you when you least expect you, that you need help from somebody to sign, all of a sudden you need it, and it's yeah, like, you know, you know, where do you go? Yeah, I know that's, that's oh, they, they, when they were over there and they had. A <coughs> Was trying to communicate with him at the desk, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and Porter just walked up and started communicating. He said it was like the lady just her whole persona mm -hmm. changed mm -hmm. because there was somebody there yeah. that could communicate with. And it's no, it's not the same as having a person, but the Google Translate app, which is still not a great translator, but it's better than it's better than nothing, and it will um, it will it will live uh, interpret. Um, conversation. So if you speak Spanish and I speak English, it can hold your phone there and I can speak English and it'll repeat what I say in Spanish to them and then they speak Spanish and it'll repeat to English me. They know. Well, they've also are working on one that will do sign and it's because you've got the video of the phone, they're working on one that by gestures and will interpret sign and then sign back. To, or or with sign, also with sign, or uh, with Lusun, I can um, say I can speak to he's deaf and I can speak to my phone and it will dictate out really quickly you know what I just said he can read it and then he can type what he wants to say back so it's getting well, it's getting well, interesting. Well uh, the great thing when Porter was in high school was um, um, you know we were up in Northern Virginia so they, they, they would go over to Gallaudet mm. for some of their their sign language mm. uh, practice mm. uh, and uh, mm. You know, that, that's uh, that, that's that's an interesting area. The uh, uh, the McDonald's and all that over at Gallaudet, they they they're, they're all of them they do sign. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's just know, it. It's, it's, right. It's, the whole community. I needed the translating thing back in mm -hmm. when my daughter was in high school. Her mm -hmm. and her girlfriend took French mm -hmm. all the way through high school and spoke it fluently. She can't say a word now, but. Mm -hmm. They used to think it was great sitting at the dining room table and talking back and forth to each other so they <laughs> could think you understand. understood. Huh? Yeah. I think that's why she took the language. Mm -hmm. You know, my, most everybody in here knows that my brain is fairly strange. <laughs> uh, stop laughing. Uh, 
what has always I've wondered about is if someone is lip reading, do they get confused by a Yankee accent and a Southern accent and a Midwestern accent? Hmm. Do they hear it? Do they no. pick up on it? That's I'll tell you, because I wear hearing aids and I also read lips. And, um, yeah, it's right. If somebody has a different accent, I'm lost. How about that? <laughs> well, well, that thank you, because I had that has <clears throat> been something. You know, I'm looking about the yeah. Probably don't watch a whole lot of NFL. Yeah, but in, in NFL, when the coaches are calling plays, mm -hmm. they're holding the clipboard up. Some people will read. The reason for that, <laughs> another, yep, Bill Belichick, uh, one of his cheating schemes was they had a guy in the stands read. on the other side who could read lips with binoculars. And so when the other team was calling the plays, they were radioing it in mm -hmm. what the plays were. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's called cheating. Well, he's been known to do that a few times. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's not cheating until they put it in the rule book. There's no no <laughs> lip reading in the rule book until they did it. <laughs> there, was, there, 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 there was no rule about coming out with a, 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 a snow plow and clearing the area off for a kicker until it happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we ready? Let's get. I'm um, him the okay, of course. Um, let's. Um, uh, come together and, and, and share what it is we can pray about today. Uh, Jillian's surgery was successful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's all right. What else? Um, Trey had a Trey. setback yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, they actually took him and moved him to rehab, which is right next to where my daughter is, and ended up having to take him immediately back. He he just, for no reason, spiked a, a fever of 103 and started throwing up. And oh. So they've done blood work. They don't know what it is this time, but he's back in the pit unit. So. Mm. Mm. It's back and forth, it's back and forth. New glasses? Different no, glasses. I mean, I'm reading glasses. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they I have a friend who's in, got legal trouble <clears throat> in mm -hmm. Georgia mm -hmm. and they have been living there since before Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and they keep pushing court dates back. They'll be there till March now mm -hmm. with a grandchild. Oh. Mm -hmm. And Dan went for a six month checkup with the oncologist and the oncologist says the blood work and everything he's doing fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yes, Good. thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We continue to pray for Sarah. She's uh, not going to have surgery this week to uh, put a TENS unit in her back. She's going to, they're going to keep working on other options for the uh, uh, abdominal pains that she's having. So. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Patty Springle yesterday. Yes. She's amazing. Yes. I was, I was like, Patty, are you sure you had a stroke? She yeah, just she's really so good, bouncing back. Absolutely. She's worried about her one leg, but it'll be. Nice. That's right. And Blanche Williams is back in the hospital um, too with, uh, she, uh, had not does not had not had enough blood, so I said, "Well, it's a good thing we had a blood drive." So there's blood in the in the uh, supply, so she had to have that. She's still at the hospital, I think. So okay. Well, let's go to God and and ask for help for all the many needs in the world, as well as for uh, uh, illumination. Lord, we come to your Scripture because we uh, love to see the Word of Life uh, played out in the past and in the present and in your preferred future and um, we look forward to how you will um, open these pages and uh, shine a light uh, into them and into our lives um, Lord we lift up uh, those that we are holding dear in our hearts uh, and look forward to uh, seeing what you can do knowing that uh, and trusting that uh, you are uh, the great physician um, as well as uh, the great healer, uh, protector, and judge of all. And we, uh, we turn these over to you as uh, prayers. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're in Acts 2. We're just about finished with Acts 2. Um, we have had the Pentecost event, and now we've had Peter's speech. And the people had asked, what shall we do? And, um, and the crowd, rather, had asked, what shall we do? And today... The people are going to ask, what shall we do? So we're going to pick up at Acts 2, uh, verse 41. And uh, 
we have again heard Peter's speech and so this is the reaction at verse 41 so those who welcomed his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 persons were added they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers all came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles all who believed were together and had all things in common they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need day by day as they spent much time together in the temple they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising god and having the goodwill of all the people and day by day the lord added to their number those who were being saved now how many people did they have in this new church back at the Pentecost moment. Do you remember? No, three. Here we get three. But before this, they were about 120 gathered in the room. Okay? And now the crowd has seen this moment, this, this wonder, and they've seen God at work. And now, uh, how many are we at? They add about 3,000, don't they? And we learn that they are dedicating themselves, devoting themselves to uh, four different key things. I mean, if we figure, you know, there's kind of a theory that if you, if people have a tendency to mess things up, which most of us go ascribe to that theory in some fashion, then, um, then if you want to know how to do things right, you need to get back and figure out what people did before they messed it up or what God did before that people messed it up. So, you know, it's not a foolproof theory, but it's, but it's, it's helpful. And so when we look back at verse 40, 42, we can find four markers of what the Christians did in those, in those times before they had to worry about buildings or, you know, um, the government or any of that kind of stuff when they were just starting reacting to the Holy Spirit what are those four things exactly the apostles teaching the fellowship the breaking of bread and the prayers and and really we really often want to come back to those as markers for what this whole thing is about you know that we do this whole body of Christ is for all the things we do uh, in some fashion should it should flow from these now they don't look exactly like these always but we need to think about what these were back then um, the Apostles teaching for example uh, who are the Apostles that are gonna teach Peter yeah, the, the 12, yeah, those kind, right? 52, perhaps. Right. So the fact that they go to those and not to the newest thing is, the, is, is a sense of what? That, that the apostles, they have the anchor of the knowledge. They, have the first, they want to go back to those who have the most close experience of Jesus in person. So today when we are weighing these things and when we're listening and you hear a new idea or a new thought or a new teaching or something that's new to your ears it may be that it's somewhat removed from the person of Jesus and what he did and said or it may be that that the Holy Spirit has helped that new teacher or person get a sense of what Jesus did anyway the point is you weigh it against what Jesus said and did and how the apostles handed that on to us it's always the plumb line, you know. Now, we take that for granted, but, I mean, we do that all the time. We don't even think about it. But it's important to name it so that when we do face something, we kind of go, does that line up with what Paul said or and what Peter did, said or what the Holy Spirit did or whatever the case may be, okay? And the apostles' teaching um, is going to be the main thing they do in worship. Uh, they're going to hear from the apostle what Jesus said what Jesus did okay and what is the Apostles scripture and Bible the Old, Testament. the Old Testament alongside the life of Jesus as they have as the Spirit you know, shares it to them so they're writing and it's going to be 
of course, the New Testament, that part. But um, the apostles' teaching is then the teaching and the preaching as, uh, as it would develop, too. The fellowship, that's pretty, that's pretty easy. We know about fellowship. We'd make a whole room called fellowship, name it after fellowship. Um, what do we mean when we say fellowship, though? Well, what are we after? The, the, certainly the sip and chat type thing, you know, the cookies and, and hospitality and that kind of thing. That's certainly part of it. Well, I mean, this is fellowship this? as far as I'm Absolutely. Concerned. Church. Sure. What do you need? You know, how are you doing? Uh, what, what's God been up to? Or where have you visiting around to one another in the hospitals or homes or telephone or anything? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> wherever you wherever and whenever you can be. The two or three gathered, uh, you know, when the spirit is with them. These are all fellowship. Even they even had a word, um, the word that they would often use or uh, for this was koinonia. Who's, who's heard of that word, koinonia? It's a fancy Greeky word, but you know, it um, it has connotations that are uh, like this, you know, um, gathered in uh, to um, in with others in a in a, a closeness and a bonding, uh, a covenant, uh, not uh, just simply a uh, how do you do. Yeah. And and some people the the how do you do is about as far into fellowship as that's as they, you know, as God they are led, and that's we don't want to. You know, there are people for whom that's just where they find peace and find God's presence in the in the larger uh, group. You know, without the whole deep personal thing. But uh, there it is. Okay, and then the breaking of the bread. What do you think that means? That could be a meal, or it could be communion. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, they probably both did hand. not separate those two. Right. Both uh -huh. hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For because, a while they didn't. Um, there are a couple of things that are clucked away in here that uh, I, I'm not a, an Acts scholar. It's one of my weakest books. Uh, but, you know, when you see 120 mm -hmm. and then 3,000, yeah, the we, we have to remember that, that numbers for them had a theological meaning yeah. uh, far more than a literal one. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, don't bet your lunch yeah. that it was 120 and 3,000 if exactly. you were to count yeah. noses. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the other little thing that, uh, now what was I going to say? <laughs> uh, uh, there's, there's, there's something unique. Uh, uh, for us, it almost seems interesting that, you know, on that day, 3,000 yeah. per se. Uh, but in the, the, uh, the early church, all the way up uh, until, uh, in, in, you know, about the 1700s, uh, uh, communities joined together, not individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you you'd have a new king and bring his whole right. his whole country in. Right. Uh, the idea of of individual salvation yeah, version and all that yeah. uh, actually kind of grows historically in time yeah uh it but it, it, you know right. that, that's really weird for us yeah because we, we that's the way we think it's supposed to happen yeah but in in early christian communities it almost never happened that way yeah and remember this we're in the um days of the house uh, the the household was the center and the the main what um, unit of your life? I mean, you your your household might be in a city, and the city had have a lot of control over you. But your life was lived out in the household, where you were a slave of so and so, or a uh, steward of this person, or you were a, a head of household, or a, a wife of the of the of the head of household. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a question now because yeah. I told you I don't know the deal. Yeah. Uh, when we talk household here, are, are we talking uh, the family unit or actually group that lived in a house? See, we, we think of the house as a group that lived in a house, but the way I understand, and, and, uh, yeah, that 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 family tribalism was still very much a part of their lives at this point, 
I don't know the Greek what to know whether we're talking about a tribe or are we talking about a house? Yeah, the the well I'm not I'm not sure yeah where I would delineate that as much. I it depends on whether it's Greek or Jewish, you know, in the Jewish life of course the tribe is your um, of your what should what the twelve twelve tribes you are. Um, but they're they're gonna gather in and, and right. It's not as much of a um, a personal conversion as it is a, uh, a life lived with, in community with other people. And so when you have fellowship, you're talking about um, something that you didn't necessarily choose to be part of, but nevertheless uh, still could be just as personal and important to the, your friends to the family. That's right. <laughs> or that way about the youth sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Their parents make them come do fellowship at youth. Uh-huh, uh-huh, you're right. But they often enjoy them. Right, right. <laughs> well, I'm not one that nobody makes do anything. <laughs> and that's our grandson. Oh, they're very, very happy and grateful. Um, yeah, so so they're going to be gathered in, you're going to gather it into this system um, and uh, be devoting to a teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and then prayers. Um, the, the prayers, is, uh, in our minds, we think of, okay, everybody bow your head. And there's some of that, but it's largely going to be, that's largely a, a word for their worship. Uh, so it, I think it encompasses more than just bow your head and let's pray. It's um, the Psalms, for example, or the hymns, well, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're prayerful. They're, all these things are going to be um, like the worship. So today when we want to focus on what people need to do as disciples, this is a really good uh, framework, you know, do they, does the person uh, devote themselves to the teaching and preaching of the apostles? And uh, it falls well and good and all things being equal, which they often aren't, the <coughs> preaching and teaching of the pastor who's following in the line of the apostles, you know, so in some, in some, in some way. With, with all the passing down and yeah. translations and everything <laughs> else, that's probably the, the thing that has always bothered me and especially going back to college. Yeah. The guy that taught the Old Testament and the guy that taught the New Testament, you would not think they were both from the same world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we're really, far removed for, from For me, areas. they weren't because my New, my, uh, new Testament professor was, was Greek Orthodox. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, yeah. both of mine were, that, mm -hmm. but, Dr. James King West thought he wrote the King James verse in the Bible. <laughs> and, uh, then the uh, the over head of the religion department, West absolutely despised students loved him. He had he had some common sense and didn't think he was Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> It, 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 the variations, you know, as many as grains on the, on the ocean. On well, the I told shore. you, that there was a group of us that if West or Selby were in the pulpit, we slept or studied. <laughs> and if our old guy or our uh, church, you know, school pastor, if he was there, then we were very attentive. That was the time of Vespers, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speaking of mandatory or uh, mm -hmm. being a part of a, a community. Um, right, so uh, it's a good check on us or on, and on what it is to be um, church uh, then. So then in verse 43, we see that all came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together. Now, before we get into that, let me mention that we're going to see a pattern of and through acts of the Holy Spirit doing something, the people noticing it, the apostle, be it Paul or Peter or whoever, teaching about it or preach, making a speech about it, preaching about it, and then the people either responding positively, negatively, or some mix thereof. So that pattern, remember that. So let's, let's say that pattern again. An act of the Holy Spirit the people reacting to and taking notice of what the Spirit did, the speech, and then the reaction to the speech. And so 
you'll get a, you're going to see that rhythm again and again. And rather than just sort of saying, well, it's just a literary function or something, what is that, what is that rhythm? I mean, it's, he, he, he tells here, we just saw the Pentecost event, then we heard Peter's speech last week, and now we see that people, um, uh, with speech, now we see how people respond you know, to that. How is that a pattern for everything that the Holy Spirit does? You know, what does that look like now? The Holy Spirit um, helped us help a lot of people with um, disaster relief, let's say. And that's a good example right in front of us, right in our, right in our, right in this room. Okay. Um, then uh, they reacted. How have they reacted to that? People have been moved by the by the work of the Spirit that the Spirit has shown up in in the life and the work of the. I don't mean the people here. I mean the community and those who see God at work. Um, and then we have an op opportunity to, and perhaps an obligation to go on, you know, telling of what God's mighty deeds and say, look, this is because we are Christians. That's what Peter did. He said, what, not because we're drunk, <laughs> not because we're just weird people, but this is because Jesus, whom you crucified, did this, et cetera, and rose from the dead, right? Um, and then people can respond to that. So um, it's important to, to not jump over that step of telling people what, why we do these things. And, and we could do that in a, in a um, humble way, in a way that honors God and doesn't toot our own horns and make it about us. But, uh, but there's a pattern there, and I think we have to figure out what, how to live into that. One thing about that to me is that um, I see a lot of people who um, are completely unaffected by what we would consider the Holy Spirit act. Mm -hmm. They can't mm -hmm. recognize it as that, either mm -hmm. because they've never been taught or they have a real um, grudge against everything. Mm -hmm. they yep. And yep. They, see, they see things in the rest of the world and say, well, if that's what this is, then I don't want it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so they're immediately turned off and <coughs> the process doesn't affect them at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I've always been more interested in how how to help those people see and be in awe. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do y'all think we do that? You know, do you understand Pam's question? How do how do we help it? people see that these things are the work of, of the Holy Spirit? Be they the big deals like that or just our ongoing work? How do we help people see that? You pray um, for them. Pray for them. Absolutely. 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 Uh, that can be that can be tough because there are sometimes people want to give the Holy Spirit credit for stuff. You know, that they go overboard. Uh, uh, you know, hmm. and God opened up the parking space right yeah. there in front yeah. of the Walmart. Yeah. You ever heard people do that stuff? Oh, yeah. And I want to say, no, he didn't. Do you want to say? Do you really think yeah. God is? That involved? Yeah, uh, I mean, some do. Uh, 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 and and, and you know, but but they, it, what that does is it takes all responsibility off of us. You know, I mean. Mm -hmm, I mean mm -hmm. But so, it, you need to. You need, when you see the Holy Spirit, if you want to convince others. I guess you need to share it. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then, when you have somebody share things that may not be seen as such, it makes. Mm -hmm. Everybody look a little foolish. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm talking. I don't know. It is. It's a hard question. Other ideas or thoughts? And well, I, I think mm -hmm. it is by you know you you have to be the one that jumps in and does something in the response to it, like we did with the food store. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and hope that other people that have not been moved by the Holy Spirit spirit before mm -hmm. see that and start to feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying too is the fellowship part of, of you know, gathering people in, the fellowship part is maybe just as important as for them to be able to see the Holy Spirit. You know? mm -hmm. Because that's mm -hmm. where they are. If you see yeah. where they are, 
Yeah, um, people don't. Uh, I need a friend or I need help. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, and I think it is. Um, I remember this woman sitting next to me, you know, uh, asking me where I went to church. And uh, mm -hmm. I said I was still looking, and she invited me to Ann Street. And I think your first impression of a church is going to make whether you stay or you don't stay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so here I am. Yeah. Uh, there's right. been a number of studies that say you've actually made the decision before you actually cross the doors into the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, we, we didn't because, I mean, we crossed the doors of several churches yeah. before we settled here. Yeah, you've I, been, I, and, I did too. And, and, and you've been a, a culture I, to... I, I give yeah. Ann Sam's credit for us being here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit working through, you know, it might be through a person like Ann, or it might be through, or Melva, or uh, um, uh, um, whoever it may be, uh, Marna, excuse me. That's all right. And, and <laughs> I know your name. I'm just saying, you know, all these M names are in here. Um, and then it might be through a person, might be through an outreach or something like that, might be through um, worship. Increasingly, people don't have their first encounter with the church through worship, through going to the, to the church service. Increasingly, they have their first encounter through uh, a mission or uh, an outreach or a uh, presence of the church outside the church building. And then they may later decide to come to worship. Maybe. They don't always do that either. But in any case, uh, and but there are so many factors that are going to make this speech. Essentially, our, what we're talking about is basically what do we do when we get to the Peter's speech section, yeah. right? And whether that's uh, something you know from the pastor on a Sunday morning, or down, or whether it's a what the a Facebook post looks like, or whether it's a um, you know a, a mission project, and what if we come with the right attitude about how we go into somebody's property and help them fix their house, you know, and how we comport ourselves and show Christ in that. I mean, so any of the dozens, hundreds of witnesses that we do all the time. Um, there's just all kinds of factors in each one of those and being thoughtful about how we do those um, trying not to make Beat some blunders you know yeah or you know and then other times um, but but not I, I think we're increasingly uh, have to be careful not to over correct for um, all the mistakes that previous Christians have made um, and overcorrect by uh, just being totally afraid to witness at all or, or point to Christ because we don't want to upset the you know the um, the people who may be sensitive about that um, so it's a yeah that's that's the question and it? it's hard but there's the but there's the the pattern and um, and we see how they now come together so what what happened what did they do back on this occasion uh, that's what we get into next at verse 44. All this is the, how this the the people in this situation react, and we're going to see other reactions when this pattern is repeated later. And they're not always positive, are they? All who believed were together, and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now, um, from 44 to the end of that chapter there, uh, we've got two halves here. 44 and 45 are uh, one way they, they reacted, and 46 and 47 are a companion way, a different a, a a separate but companion way. The 44 and 45 have to do with the economic and they and they and the lifestyle. Okay, the uh, the and we'll talk about that. And then 46 and 47 uh, talk about they went to the temple a lot, which means they went to church a lot. They went to worship a lot, and they broke bread at home. So they didn't just uh, have these meals, these important common table meals together uh, at church but at, at temple but at home too ate their food with glad and generous hearts and they praised God and had the goodwill of the people so that's 
the second half. Now, what do we make though? And we, you know, we don't. There's a lot can be said, and a lot has been derived from verses 44 and 45. Uh, a couple of my uh, friends live in um, intentional Christian communities. There's even a new term now called the new monasticism. Has anybody ever heard of this? And so there's, uh, you know, it's, but it's sort of a rehash of the, um, in the 60s and 70s, some of the Jesus people movement, people uh, formed intentional communities. And then um, some people formed them, you know, around this particular verse, essentially. And then other people formed communities like that around political and ideological reasons. And they were often called communes. But there were people doing it for Christian reasons based on this passage. And there are some who do today, um, where they live in the same spot, uh, share all their possessions. Uh, they don't, they relinquish their name to all manner of things, their car and everything else, uh, bank accounts and all that. That's yeah. called a cult. <laughs> <laughs> and well then, and people called the early apostles crazy, but then on the other hand, um, we're still back at the early days. Now this, maybe this was an experiment, some say. This was an experiment and they weren't really getting it totally right in the way that they went on later to not live like that necessarily was more there were, right. There were a number of such communities mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, uh, all the, all the, the, the you know, Greek priesthoods were all well, like that too. The community of Qumran mm -hmm. is the classic mm -hmm. example. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls end up mm -hmm. being found. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was a, 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 a yep. Jewish group that had decided to live together in a spiritual community uh, Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't going to last too long because one of their vows was celibacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, but and, and you know, so, so that wasn't that no. uh, uh, uncommon right. for their time uh, as it would be for ours. Right. And you think now of uh, convents and monasteries. I mean, uh, the shakers. Shakers. Uh huh. That's right. There are also um, what's the uh, not the Luddites, but the there's another group that. Um, of married families, you know, mar married uh, couples with families, but um, they swore off uh, sex and procreation, and they died within the. It was uh, but, well, yeah, some that yeah, some some groups of the Shakers too, and in, in that, and there, there's another one I'm thinking of is kind of coastal, in South Carolina. But anyway, they they were gone after a generation, so as you can imagine, Doug, you had a hand up too. Yes, yeah, so a number of years ago, so of our dear Jewish friends had, had told us about our, a group in, called the Children of Light out in Arizona, and we went and spent about three days with them, and they, each one were called the elect, and they had a upper room that was a very special place where they conducted, we weren't a part of it, but uh, you know, on occasion there would be uh, a gathering there, and. Uh, shared everything. They had a, a <clears throat> they grew their own food and uh, I mean they were out in the middle of nowhere. We went down about a 20 mile dirt road to get to where they were and uh, it was it was truly uh, a, an enlightening experience and we're still through one another connected uh, in correspondence. So, uh, several of them had died. The, the main lady that started it was Alette Gold, and she has since passed away. But uh, it was truly uh, an enlightening experience mm -hmm. to, to see, you know, what mm -hmm. they had developed there by them, you know, mm -hmm. as a community. There was only about seven or eight of them, and they would have people that would come in from time to time and make contributions to their gardening styles and. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, hmm. That's a large group of Mennonites when, where I grew up. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Taylor, I had a, a history professor one time that was talking about scripture, and he said, uh, even the early Christians tried yeah. communism and it didn't work. <laughs> it's referring to that, yeah. But it, it, could they have been working on the premise of when Jesus said, what's it to you if Peter stays until I return? Mm -hmm. Therefore, he's going to come real, 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 real soon. Mm -hmm. 
could they have been working off that? Well, what, what teachings of Jesus do you do y'all think brainstorm from it? Are there teachings of Jesus that that they might have had in mind or, or that would have lent themselves to to this arrangement? You know, well, I, I think of what do you think the, they based uh, it on? When um, the, uh, what was it, a prince uh, or whatever he was asked Jesus what he needed right. to do. Yeah. And he sell said, sell you. everything yeah. and follow me. Mm -hmm. And I always connect that mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Any others that you think of? Somewhere it says, I'm coming soon. Right, right. I don't remember exactly right. where. Lo, I'm with you always. He, he called them away from their families yeah. and, you know, let the dead bury the dead and all that kind of thing, too. Uh, what do you think, if you, if you zoom back at kind of what they were after here and shedding away sort of our, our notions of what's going on, what, what do we think is their, what core values were they expressing by doing this? What was, whether it worked or didn't work, or we, whether you do it or, or you wouldn't do it, or any of that kind of stuff, all very important, certainly. What do you think they were really, you know, what, what, what do you think th that they're after? And why would Luke make sure to tell us about it like this? That everyone is equal in some sense and, and deserving. Everyone yeah. is deserving. Right. It's a sense of community, yeah. They're, they're belonging to one another, depending on one another, trusting one another. How about that? Think about the trust it takes to live into this, because anybody could. They lived under Roman law, too. Yes, they had to be careful and yeah. anybody, stick together. Any, any of them could take advantage of the rest of the others. And we'll see in, a, in another uh, nearby story how they dealt with that or how God dealt with that when, yeah. but the ideas of Christian community that we generally think of are, 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 are not here yet mm -hmm. I mean when they you know it says they went to the temple every day that was the Jewish temple mm -hmm. that was there in Jerusalem mm -hmm. that they went to mm -hmm. every day yeah that, that wasn't you know the, the, the Methodist church around the corner right yeah and uh, you know, we're still dealing with, with people who are 100% Jews. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and Judaism, I mean, Christianity is simply a, a sect within that. Yeah, people, followers of the way. That's about all they kind of managed to get for a name. Yeah. Now, so we're, we're looking at these people as ones who are living out this immense trust and intimacy with one another. Um, they, can they just uh, do whatever they want to do in their lives without worrying about how it affects other people? Not in this setting, I don't think, you know. Um, would we, would any of us do this? Would we choose, it? what would it look like? I, I don't know, I've, you know, I know answers that run the gamut, you know. Oh, that's communism to, to all, all the way over to Boy, that's amazing. I would love to have be in that you know, kind of life. I've, I've seen the whole gamut, and, and by totally reasonable people, not um, uh, wackadoodle people or anything, you know, but really, you know, studying it, people who think it's a bad idea, think, think it's a good idea. But Does it sound like the yeah. people are trying to hedge their bets? I mean, they go to the temple every day, and then they go meet and they uh, praise Christ. Possibly, I think it's a lot of what Jim was mentioned too yeah, though, about there yet. that this is. Yeah, I don't think so. I think this is either. I, th I think this is like um, heavily contextualized to the Jewish life and culture too. And, and there and were the Greek, there uh, were household. Now, and all that, you know. I don't know a whole lot about Acts, but I do know that you know a whole lot about Old Testament and, and Judaism. You know, yeah. as you as you approach those those early centuries BC, yeah. there were many. Many of these Jewish communities yeah. Yeah. Uh, that 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 were were, were present, uh, and, and it was it was it was just not something that would have ever been looked at as odd. That's totally radical. Uh, right? uh, yeah, as right. radical like right. like we would. It, I mean, right. you know, they, they they're still finding ruins of these Jewish communities. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you yeah. know, in, in, in those early years. And he had to do something like that. He had to live in at least a large enough um, community uh, to have a critical mass for protection, food, you know, division of labor, all these things too. So there was some appeal to it in that way as well. There wasn't uh, the sense of ownership society and that kind of thing. And they certainly weren't sitting around trying to think of how, I don't think, I, I, I think we have to be careful not to think they were thinking of how to, how to form some, something totally countercultural. Um, <coughs> although the fact that it is different from our culture now, we certainly can take away lessons from that and say, hey, you know, may, do we, does it mean we just jump in head first and do exactly what they're doing? Not necessarily, but, but that we can kind of take from that wow, you know, this is, this is not just about people I know from church. Being church is being a part of a community that shares. Now, one way we share, you know, we, there are some ways that we live out, especially even the economic thing here. How do we now, in some fashion, live out this selling of possessions and goods and distributing to all as any had need? How do we do that? You know, sorry? Taxes. Uh-huh, well... There's and, and the gifts to the and church, gifts, the uh -huh. to the church and to the yeah. Yeah. Uh, other organizations around. Absolutely. You know, the Absolutely. food pantries and Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. They had to increase daily because after they had sold their possessions and goods and they gave to anyone who was in need. They're going to run out if they don't increase daily to have somebody else sell their yeah. possessions. <laughs> What's interesting is, you know, yeah, sort of, but at the same time, the theology of, of abundance that's in here or the understanding of God providing for them is another striking um, characteristic of this, too, that there's uh, the sense that, um, that God is... Uh, that, that, that God has provided all they need and they live in trust of that and certainly with adding people. But as I've said recently, the default equilibrium position of this gospel is to be growing and gathering and going out, you know, not to just be where it is. So, um, so I think that's, yeah, I think it's a both and in that. Um, one of the things we're doing in um, small groups, uh, we're forming this and starting new small groups as well as talking and training old existing groups, uh, be it your Sunday school class or your circle or whatever, to um, take note of some markers of uh, community. And we use Acts 2.42. Uh, Linda uh, Hebner's helped partner with me in this and Julia's partnered in this some too. And we uh, talk to them about, uh, group leaders about, uh, these are the four things, yeah, but see you soon. Um, these are the four things that mark a covenantal community in Christ. So does your circle or your um, science school class or your Bible study group or your whomever, do you devote yourselves to apostles' teaching in some way? So, you know, do you either as a group or as encourage each other to come to worship? Uh, do you break bread and fellowship and pray? You know, and do you have prayer in your group, in your time and place. And these new groups that we're doing, like um, with all these interest areas, the interests are areas are just vehicles to form a group of people, some of whom will be people here, but we also hope are reaching new people who aren't here in the church um, around that interest area. And then we'll engage in these practices in some, in some fashion that is helpful and appropriate for them. So let's say you've got a kayaking group, you know, and it's a couple people from church who like to do it, and a couple people from the of their friends, and um, but you say a prayer before you go or when you get back or something like that. And over time, uh, you share some scripture, and you know we go to worship, and maybe they come too. So have these practices, and when you live out these practices, that's what that's what people that's part of what people are coming in. That's part of the power of the gospel reaching people. Um, it's not because they just heard that you guys were, you know oh that church is really cool or you know. Oh, that church has great coffee or something like that. It's because of these practices. So we don't we don't put the cart before the horse and say, "Come over here because we're so awesome," or you know, we've got the best smoke machine or whatever on our stage. But you know, come over here because we're and then you'll see what we do. 
but we live out these things, and then people are drawn to that. People want to be part of that. So, all right. We seem to um, be reaching a pretty good uh, place to wrap up here. Uh, I think what we really, what I want to encourage us to do is um, anchor ourselves to those things in 42, be inspired by what we see in 44 and 45, and live into 46 and 47. Uh, Wait, say that again. Yeah. <laughs> um, anchor to verse 42, uh, the four areas, you know. Be inspired by 44 and 45 and the, uh, what they did, how they lived it out there and then. And then follow uh, 46 and 47, which is day by day as they spent much time together in the temple. So that means you have to be here. <laughs> um, they broke bread at home. So it was also you know, throughout their home and temple. Ate their food with glad and generous hearts. So whether they were eating food or whatever they were doing, glad and generous hearts. And most of all, praising God and having the uh, goodwill of all the people. So they were, you know, they were good neighbors and they were um, valued in the community. Now, certainly there are times that Christians need to um, do what's right, even if it's not popular. But, but having the goodwill of all the people is certainly um, appropriate, don't you think? Um, so in your own life, personally, as we go from this time, uh, be, be thinking perhaps, carrying that around as a model, and, and I will do this, and I want, and invite you to do this too, is, is to ask yourself as you go about the week ahead, um, in what way am I living into those behaviors? And in what way is God pressing me to live into them even at the inspiration of those disciples who so radically did so by selling everything. No, are you to go sell everything? I, I, we've talked about how we live into that now. And certainly living, you know, being generous is, uh, in all the forms, is appropriate. But what is it that we, where do we hold back, you know? Where do we, not necessarily just money, but just in our own lives, is there some you know, pocket of our lives that we haven't really given over? Uh, uh, is there some um, way in which we're, God is nudging you to uh, surrender you know, in some way? Uh, something you hold on to. Uh, and how deep, how, how deep can God get with that? Uh, so, good questions to carry around. Sound like a plan? Yeah. <laughs> challenging, challenging, for sure. Okay. All right. Well, Julia, will you close us in prayer? Okay. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word and for letting it come out into this space. And we just ask that... Your word and your spirit continue to spill out in us and in Ann Street and in this community and in the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Oh, Good to see you. you. <laughs> uh, hey, um, I, yeah, you enjoyed the book, right? <laughs>